You're listening to Artistic Finance, show 116. Today's show is a rewind episode with painter Destiny Powell. We discuss cars as liabilities, her seven streams of income, how to make money work for you, how Destiny became a full-time painter, passive investing, including rental real estate, and the advantages to paying taxes instead of writing everything off. With these Rewind episodes, we are revisiting some of my favorite episodes from the past. Now, I'm sharing these episodes for a few reasons. One, we get new listeners each week, so the new listeners might not have heard this episode before. Two, even if you've been listening for a while, you may have missed something in the episode when it originally aired. And three, even if you've heard the episode before, you might learn something new. If you watch this on YouTube, the audio doesn't necessarily match up to the video. When we first released this episode, I wasn't publishing on YouTube, so you'll get an idea of how we interviewed, but don't try to match our lips to the audio. All right, that's everything I have for this new intro. Everything going forward will be from the original show. Welcome to the Artistic Finance Podcast, where we break down the wall between art and money. If you're here looking for how to be an artist and financially sustain a career, you're in the right place. Keep listening and join us as we learn about artists and how they make money work for them. Hello, everyone. This is your host, Ethan Steimel, here for episode 40. Thank you for being here and a special thank you to my Patreon patrons who get the shows early and have access to the extended interviews. If you want to support me and the show, do that at patreon.com slash artistic finance. But if you aren't ready to become a patron, there is something that you can do that is equally, if not more, valuable. That is to tell someone about this show. If you share it with an artist, even better. But what we discuss is applicable to anyone, especially what we learn from today's guest. She is an artist, but takes the business and investing side of life by the horns. She has seven streams of income and is working on two more. And that guest is Destiny Powell, a painter based in Tennessee. She creates acrylic paintings, watercolors, and digital art. What I love about her paintings is her use of the colors gold, yellow, and amber. Check them out for yourself by searching her trademarked name, Poetically Illustrated. Links to that and all her social handles and everything we talk about is in the show notes or on our website, artisticfinance.com. Now, we packed a lot into this hour. We couldn't fit it all in, so the additional audio is over on Patreon. Destiny is hardworking, a hustler, and super chill. You are going to leave this episode inspired and in awe. Without further ado, let's get to our interview. Welcome, Destiny Powell, to the podcast. Thank you. (laughs) Before we start, I just want to say that we're recording this on January 20th, 2021. We are amidst a COVID-19 pandemic. We are amidst a Black Lives Matter slow burn across the world. And today was the inauguration of our 46th president in the United States, Joe Biden. Yes. Could you sort of give us a brief recap of how you got into your career, how you got into art, and then where you are with it today? So my dad and my mom were really young when they had me. So my mom was 15. My dad was 17. By the time I was like three to four-ish, they were in college. And my dad went to college for architecture. So when they were doing their work, they needed me to be occupied. (laughs) So he would give me like an extra sketchbook or a piece of paper. And I would just tell me to like copy something out of the book, like write something or draw something. So one day he, there was a girl I remember it was a girl in the book and she had like these big braids and it was like a history book. So it was like an African person, like a tribal picture. And I drew it, but I made the hair pink. And then when I got up to like go get a snack or something, my dad was like, did you just do that? And I I was like, yeah, I did. So he would kind of sit and show me different shapes and different ways to like draw things. But he didn't think anything of it. I was a kid. But when I drew the person from the book, he framed it. He still has it at his house today. And he was like, oh, you're going to be an artist. From there, I think from three, I always drew every single day. He gave me a sketchbook. By high school, they put me in private art lessons. And I took art classes all through high school. In college, I studied art and business. 
because <laughs> they were like, you got to go to college, but you can study art. But we just need you to study one more thing. So you can do graphic design, web design, whatever you want to do, because I was really into uh, technology and MySpace pages back then. Like I was designing those. <laughs> <laughs> Dating yourself. <laughs> right. So they were like, OK, you got to do something else so we know that you can make some money. So I was like, OK, I'll do graphic design and then I'll just kind of play around in business. So I took a lot of business courses and I joined like an entrepreneurship club. I also had my first child in college. I was 19 with my first son. So through school, I was working and doing all these classes and joining all these clubs. And then when I graduated, I was like, okay, I got to make money. But (laughs) but I don't know necessarily where I'm going to go with that because I didn't have like an art job. I was doing college jobs. I got a retail job because my husband was military. We moved to Arizona. So we get to Arizona. I found a job in retail at Oshkosh and Carter's. The store was visually not pleasing to me. So when they would give me the paper to like set up the store and dress the mannequins, I wouldn't do what I was supposed to do. And the manager over me would come in the next day and she's like, we're going to get in so much trouble when the district manager comes to look at the store because it's nothing like this paper. And I'm like, well, the paper isn't right. Like I know the customer, I worked here long enough and they, they're not shopping this way. So the district manager came in and she was uh, she wasn't really upset, but she was like, "Okay, it's easier for me to shop this way. She spoke to her manager who was like, we need Destiny to do something else because she's great in retail. She can sell anything, but her design skills are next level. So she put me over the aesthetic of the stores for Arizona area. So like Glendale, Scottsdale, Phoenix. And she sent me to a different store to set it up, like to stay there, study the customers, how they shopped and then set the store up. I moved into like a creative design. I was two years in Arizona and then my husband and I deployed and I got pregnant with our second son and I was in Arizona alone. So once I had the baby, my mom came and was like, okay, you can't stay here by yourself. You got two kids, you're working 60 hours a week. You need some help. So I moved back South where I am now in Tennessee, but I transferred my job to Murfreesboro um, in Nashville. Uh, I forgot what the South was like. So (laughs) when I got here, nobody wanted to do what I wanted them to do. And I just didn't feel welcome. There's a 24 year old trying to tell me what to do. And I've been working here for 20 years. I don't want to hear it. So actually one day I was, I was working. This lady came in all the time with her husband and her child. And she would say, who designed this store? Every time I come in here, you know, it was never this easy to shop. So she was like, well, I work for Nissan. And I want you to come work for me. And I'm like, doing what? She said, design, exactly what you're doing here. I want you to design our stores, like our car, set it up for the customers. So I went to (laughs) Nissan Infinity and I worked with them on like discovering their customers, what they liked. I made their flyers and like uh, showed them how to market through email, um, the best way that video would reach people and stuff like that. So all marketing, still no art. But I would be sitting at my desk and I would draw the cars. One day, one of the dealers, the dealership owner said, can you draw one of these cars like really big, paint it and we're going to put it up over here and I'll pay you. And he gave me, I want to say it was like $1,500 extra on my check because he talked to the, the boss about it. And I was like, OK, cool. But eventually another boss, a higher up would say, who, who painted that? And they would say, well, Destiny, she's over there. And you can ask her about it. And they were like, well, if you paint my wife for our anniversary, you know, I'll pay you. Or if you paint my daughter. So eventually I'm making more money painting <laughs> than I am doing these stores. And I was having more fun painting than I was designing these stores. This was a great job. I mean, I loved it. But it got to a point where it was like, I don't want to do this. Like, this isn't it. And I just felt sick every day because I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing. So I talked to my husband and he was like, well, you don't want to do it anymore you can quit sit down make a plan and go like quit put your two weeks in I don't care so I made a business plan and I I put it off for a year (laughs) I kept saying you know I'm gonna do it yeah I'm gonna do it next month next month I'm gonna do it and I sat at my job I had the notebook somewhere I just showed it to him but on there it was 2016 but I made a business plan for 2017 it was probably like a 40 page book. And I filled it up with different ways I can make money as an artist and how I was going to do it, who I was going to reach out to, what I was going to require them to pay me, it's like how I would find them and all this stuff. And he read it and he was like, okay, 
I'll take it, you know, you're ready to quit. <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm not. So um, I think it was about, yeah, it was about March of 2016. I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. So I went in, put my two weeks in. The boss was upset, but he was like, okay, I understand, you know, if, if that's what you need to do, but you can always come back. So like after the two, week, two weeks were up and the next day I was sitting at home and I was like, I think I need to go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't know what to do. Like, I was like, how do I start? But I had a website and I had started um, posting my commissions on Instagram because I wasn't doing any personal work then. I was just doing commissions. And I was getting like a following from just posting the paintings or process pics and stuff like that. So I was like, you know what? I'll just, I'll release my price list and I'll take a bunch of commissions. From March to June, I took about 80 commissions that was enough money to kind of get me going. And then someone I did a commission for said, hey, do you have any, you know, stuff that you did just because you wanted to? And I was like, no, but I can. He was like, well, if you can get three pieces for me, I want you to come do this show in Nashville. And it was called Vanguard Nashville. I think they, they did it before COVID. Basically a guy who works in tech for airplanes, like the technology for airplanes. And he's African-American. He went to all these events where art was being displayed, but none of it looked like us. And he was like, I know there's some black artists out here somewhere who can, you know, make beautiful things that make us feel like we're represented or, you know, I want to support a black artist. So I got three pieces ready and I brought it. I didn't even show him. I just you know, showed up the day of the show with the pieces. And he was like, oh my God, did you make prints? And I'm like, no. So he calls someone, hey, I got a girl here. She just brought in these beautiful pieces and I need prints like ASAP. So this this show starts in three hours. Can you give me some prints in three hours? But he came, picked up my pieces. He scanned them and made prints. And he was like, okay, sell these for $25 each. And they were probably eight by 10, 11 by 14. And I had a, a, probably a hundred of each of the three pieces. And I left that night with about $5,000 from the people at the show buying the print. And I sold all three of the pieces for like a thousand plus. And I was like, oh, I can do this. <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of how we got started. And then from right now, I mean, we're probably about seven different streams of income in and I'm still good. I never went back to work. <laughs> <laughs> That is amazing. Um, I think we know your creative personality a little bit already, but I'm going to ask these questions of you. Um, what is a live event that you like to experience as an audience member? I love a gallery, but um, my travel was cut short. One of my favorite events that I've actually got to experience was um, Afrotech and what is it called? Afropunk. So Afrotech was like a mixture of art and technology and like all these speakers from business events and different creative backgrounds, people who made apps and like all types of stuff. I like to blend all that together. I love business. I love creativity. And I'm, I love tech. I like Essence Festival. I got to go there three times. It was amazing. <laughs> <But> <laughs> I love sisterhood and like family. Like I'm a big family person. So and then music. Oh my God, I love music. So a lot of different events that I love. <laughs> Okay, so I've never had a painter to ask this question of. What is a piece of art that you like? I like this artist. She's a quilt artist called Bisa Butler. Well, they look like paintings. They really do. You should look it up. But it's these large quilts of like historical photos. Some of them are just regular people, but some of them are like Marley King Jr. She did one, a Black Panther. Like they're all different types of fabric, like layered on top of each other. So it's like con all the contrast and it looks like painting and like she painted it, but it's a quilt. Uh, like I could stare at it all day and see something different. And the colors are so vibrant, but um, she, I listened to her interview and she said there was a time where black artists didn't use the color white or black in their pieces because they wanted there to be like a wide variety of colors. So there's no white or black in any of her pieces. It's amazing. Like I could stare at them all day. I'm going to find her and I'll post a link to her stuff. It's, it's beautiful. Well, she's everywhere. She's been on Time Magazine, Essence Magazine. It's amazing. So that's your creative personality. On to your financial personality. Are you bad or good with money? I'm now happy to say that I am good with nice. money. <laughs> <laughs> if you had to pick a point where you decided you were good, money. was it like when you went out on your own? Oh, no. Um, probably around 25 ish, about 25 to 26. I'm 29 now. 
So it took a while to get good with money. And I've had a job since I was 14. So Growing up, did you have good financial examples to learn from? I can't say I did. Um, my mom has always been like a super hustler. So I was raised by a single mom. I, she wasn't bad with her money, but it was like if I wanted something that I didn't need, she would spend the bill money to get it. And I'm like, no, we probably shouldn't did that, you know, thinking back. And then um, she she always told me, like, you work hard for your money. So if you want something, you should just get it. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Either. <laughs> and it was my husband who taught me, like, yeah, you you might want, you know, this these those shoes in the moment. But like if you in long term, you want a home for your family, you want an art studio or you can open it up for other people to come and have classes like you have bigger dreams. So you need to do something smart with that money that one hundred dollars you're going to put on those pair of shoes. Let's put that in a stock or something, you know, so stuff like that. But, yeah, no, I don't. I can't say that I had good examples of money. I don't know anyone who had a savings account or a bank account that wasn't in the negative. (laughs) So, no, I didn't. Yeah, that's not surprising to me at all. Actually, a lot of people have the same. Yeah, it's just and it's also something we don't talk about, which, of course, is why I'm doing the podcast. Yeah, well, we need to talk about it because somebody needs a good relationship with money. (laughs) At the start of your career. So I guess that's when you switched your full time job and went into art. What did your finances look like then? Okay, so then we were actually okay because when I got when the jobs that I was I was doing, I was making plenty of money. It was a great job, as I said. I mean, they definitely paid me for my time. So they paid me enough to where my husband always has had this thing where whatever job we have, no matter what, we're going to pay ourselves first and put that into a savings account. So if one of us loses a job or whatever, aren't paid for whatever reason, we have enough money to sustain us for, we worked up to like, okay, so if someone loses their job, we got three months of income. If someone loses their job, we got six months. And once we hit six months, we'll save for a year and stuff like that. So we had enough money set aside so that I could take care of us, even if I didn't bring in any income. That situation was fine. I had savings, so I was good to go. And you worked six years of retail, or maybe it wasn't retail, six years of a full-time job? Six years of full-time jobs, yes. And I was always saving, even when I was only making $10 an hour. So Okay. And did you have like a plan of like, if I don't sell enough art, I'll go back and get a job? Or did you not look back like that? No, even though I physically wanted to, because like I said, since I was 14, I had never not had a job, like money, steady money coming in. In my mind, I'd be like, I'll just go get a job. But the goal was no, like this has to work because this is what you're supposed to do. And I've always felt that's what I was supposed to do. So no, there was never, if I don't make any money, I'll go back. No, I'm going to make money was the only mentality I had. (laughs) Nice. Yeah, 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 totally. Do you have any debts right now, like student loans or anything like that? No, because my husband served 10 years in the military. So we worked into our contract that we would pay, they would pay our student loans. So they paid a portion of it and then we paid a portion of it. And I had um, academic grants and things like that in school. So thankfully, didn't have a lot of school debt. And you don't have to answer this. I don't, it's not really a question, but I'm going to ask it. But do you own a home or do you rent? We own our home. We have um, three rental properties and one more we're trying to secure now. Whoa. (laughs) Okay. You're the, you're, you really are good with money. That's the real deal. I didn't see that coming. All my husband, like, this was that was his idea. He wanted to start an investing company, an investment company. So the home we're in now will also add to our rental properties once we find some land and build our home, which is what we're working on now. But um, yeah, we have a couple of rental properties, like a little bit of real estate to kind of get us, you know, extra money. Yeah, I think that's interesting because I think if you want to build wealth across the world, but especially in the United States, if you want to get actual wealth, I think real estate has to come into play at some point in your life. It has to be there somewhere. And luckily we heard, I don't know how he got inspired with real estate, but one day he he listens to a lot of money podcasts. So one of the people he was listening to was like, yeah, you got to have real estate. I don't care if it's land. I don't care if it's a building. I don't care, you know, if it's houses in your neighborhood. 
but we got into a real estate a couple of years ago and it was worth it. <laughs> it was worth it. And th- and this is just a side tangent. So I'll get back to everything else. I'm sorry, you live in Tennessee, Nashville or where in? Uh, we're right outside of Nashville in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, but I work, prim- well, I worked primarily in Nashville with my art. So that's why I say I'm Nashville based. But we live in Murfreesboro, so it's outside of Nashville. It's also one of the fastest growing cities, if you look it up, Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Okay. And are your rental properties all near where you are? Two of them are in the neighborhood that we live in because we go on runs and walks and we're out with the kids and we're like, oh, the house is for sale. And we look at it, it's basically, well, before this year, everything was like at a pretty good it was a buyer's market and now it's a seller's market. So we're trying to get something before it gets too high. But everything was pretty reasonable to buy when we started buying. So, yeah, the two of them are in this neighborhood and the other two are like in a city, maybe 30 minutes away from us. So we can still check on them if we need to. OK, and I just I just love real estate. So I'm going to ask more questions and feel free to say stop talking about this. No, you're fine. Go ahead. OK, are they single family or are they multifamily? One, the one that we're trying to get right now is multifamily. Um, so it's two townhomes that are connected and the others are single family homes. How recently did you get these like the last two years? 2019 and 2020. Uh, early 2020, maybe around February was one of the last ones we got. And then this year we've been looking around for some more. Well, late 2020, <laughs> we were looking around for some more stuff like in the summer and stuff. Um, OK, and last question about this, which is. I assume you have mortgages on all of them, or did you buy them cash? We have mortgages on two of them. We got mortgages on the other two, but we had some extra money. We got the mortgages to pay for credit reasons for that business. So um, it looks better if you don't buy cash. You just you know do a big deposit or whatever, so you'll have a reasonable uh, monthly payment. But it looks better on your business credit. If you finance, if you can, but you got to have some kind of liquid assets in the bank for them to finance multiple homes. Because we had a certain amount of assets available, they gave us mortgages and then we just paid off. Like we'll probably make five or six months of payments on time and then just pay it off and then it'll boost it quickly if you need a quick boost. (laughs) Yeah, that's awesome. And I just asked so many questions about the real estate, because I think that's one of those investments that like for artists, like the time to find a property and get the mortgage and all that and set up property management. Yes, that's a lot of time. But once you have it, it's sort of like set and forget. Well, we saved and researched for a year before we purchased. So yeah, it's a good asset to have. And and it's not connected to the stock market, because I feel like a number of artists are wary of the stock market. Yes. My husband kind of plays around with it. I just give him the money if he asks. So like, yeah, just take it. But I don't know much about it. It's kind of a headache to me because it's like I got to watch it. And I don't I don't want to watch it. So (laughs) I just want it to kind of do what it's supposed to do and bring me the return. Like, I don't want to deal with that. He figured out ways to like make it work for him. He likes the stock market and he's he's been playing around with that for the past two years and he gets returns and stuff. But I just like to see my money and know that, you know, it's coming. And if somebody drops something, I don't I don't have time for that. No, he plays with it. If he if he has something he feels strongly is going to do something. I'm like, OK, just use whatever. And don't tell me about it if it fails. <laughs> do, do you think or do you worry about money on a daily basis? I don't anymore. But uh, the reason why is because of all my reading. I read a lot. I love books. I'm a bookworm. The reason money hasn't been an issue for me, number one, is because my husband taught me how to use my money. And number two is when I left my job, I asked God, whoever you believe in, but I asked God for one thing, please make sure that I can take care of my family and anything that they need, that we have all that we need in abundance so that I can take that strain off of my art. As long as I did what I was supposed to do, I never had to worry about the money. Like when I first left my job, yeah, the the week, the first week or two, I was like, what am I going to (laughs) do? What am I going to do? But um, once I figured out ways, you know, to make my art work for me in the ways that I didn't make my turn my passion into like a job and I still have the love for it, then I was fine. I don't worry about money anymore. (laughs) 
not on a daily basis. No, sometimes I'm like, okay, we want to buy some land. Maybe we need to make like $20,000 real quick. And I'll just throw it out there and I'll think of ways to make $20,000 of ways I can contribute to that money coming to me, but I just choose not to chase it. And it kind of comes to me. Taking a break from the episode to mention our Patreon page. Patrons get the outtakes from today's interview where we talk about Jane the Virgin, homeschooling, saving money on shipping using third-party services that aren't the United States Postal Service, wrapping shipping costs into the price of your product, how being good with money has helped Destiny get traveling and speaking engagements to talk to other artists, and how listening to business podcasts has helped Destiny with selling her art. You, the patron, will also have access to the archive of previous outtakes and bonus content, and most importantly, you're supporting our mission to help artists talk openly about finances so that we can all be like Destiny and be good at art, but also at the business side of things. You can become a patron for as little as $3 a month, or you can save 6% by signing up for an annual membership. You can sign up at patreon.com slash artistic finance. Thank you in advance for your support. And now back to the show. How do you make money off of your paintings? So it's a, that is actually a simple but loaded question because all of us make money differently but I have multiple streams of income. So my website, which has prints, t-shirts, hoodies, posters, canvases, stickers, like the list goes on, like the different things that I make, tapestries now. That brings in a lot of money. I don't I would say about 40% of my income is my personal website. And then, which I'm not really doing this year or last year, commissions brought in a lot of money. So custom orders, portraits, logos. I don't know, flyer designs, like different things people wanted. So I am working with publishing companies. So I have four publishing companies that I work for on 1099. Those are about six figure contracts. And I signed at least two of them a year. Publishing contracts, commissions, website, um, get, uh, events, which, okay, since COVID, I'm not doing any events, but it was like festivals and gallery shows and um, anywhere where I was making an appearance, if I was speaking or something like that, and I had to set up like a booth or a table or a store, that brought in extra money. Oh, and I rent or lease my art to production companies like filming studios for shows like Nashville that was filmed in Nashville and shows in Memphis and like different production companies will lease work or rental companies for homes. They want art in when they stage the homes for sale and stuff like that. I lease my art to them and they, they give it back to me. And that's also money. So a lot of different things. <laughs> okay, that's that's fascinating. I didn't know about the renting of art. Yeah. And there's also the licensing, which you can do with. Um, I do licensing with a company called iCanvas. People like, let's see, Urban Outfitters, Bed Bath & Beyond, Ross, Marshalls, TJ Maxx, Zoo Lily will purchase a number of prints, canvas prints, posters and things to sell in their store. And you get a, a license check every month or so from those sales. OK, and then the only one I didn't really understand was the publishing because you said those are six figure contracts. Yes, because. It requires a lot of work and they publishing companies, if you negotiate right, will pay you for the amount of time that they they pay you your living wage on top of whatever you're doing for them if you nego negotiate it right. So right now I'm doing two children's books for one publishing company and that's about 25 pages each. So you can negotiate your price per page. When I started out, it was like 300 per page, but it's not that anymore. I do like six to 800 per page. Um, and then I'm doing a tarot deck. That's like 45 cards. So that's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of work. So if you say I, I need at least $3,000 a month as my living wage, because you're taking me away from my other responsibilities. And it, even in the contract, it says nothing can um, conflict with the work you have to do with us. If nothing can conflict, I need to live. <laughs> you got to pay me for living. So if you say, I need 3000 a month, and that just covers my basic necessities like rent, food, and whatever else I need. And then on top of that, this is the fee per page or per illustration that I have to do for you. So for seven months, multiply 3000 by that, 
and as well as each illustration I'm doing for you. So those are really great deals and they'll pay you for your work. They'll pay you for your time. And I appreciate that. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, you appreciate it, but also, I mean, you are doing work for them. Uh, yeah, that's actually what I, where I put in a lot of work for them, which is why I'm not necessarily doing my own personal work right now. But I'm taking the summer off because I'll be done with all my projects by March. And I'm going to take March to like August off to just paint and do whatever I want to do. You sound like a very successful artist to me. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, whether or not... You are? I don't know. but <laughs> well, To me, I am. But, you know, it depends on what you equate success with. But for me, I, I live a very comfortable life. And I'm OK with that. But, but something that is repeating on this on all, in all these interviews, something that keeps repeating is that artists have to know their value and know their worth. And to me, you selling that painting, that very first one of the car for fifteen hundred dollars. Yes. I mean, I'm sure you put in plenty of hours to make that painting mm-hmm. and the supplies cost you X amount or whatever. So, OK, maybe you got five hundred dollars on top of everything else. Right. But like that's a decent amount of money, whereas I think a lot of people that start younger artists seem to charge like one hundred dollars for a painting or something. To me, it's like that's unsustainable because your art supplies are 50 or more. Right. You're charging what you need to be, it seems. Yes. Well, when you are charging people like company CEOs and execs, you can't say $100. They're not going to want to buy it. So <laughs> you have to know who you're who you're speaking to. So while definitely I have affordable stuff because I think people should be able to afford art, that's what the prints are for. But the things that I put my time into, the originals, you got to pay for that because that's a lot of time. That's my connection to a piece that I, I created from my vision, from my thoughts, from my experiences that I'm giving to you. So I'm giving you a piece of me. I'm not just going to give that away. Yeah, you got to know how much you value yourself. And you can't be afraid. Like if someone says, no, that's too much, then that's fine. You'll find someone who really wants it and trusts you and trusts your vision. They'll buy it. So, What is the best financial decision that you've ever made? Real estate was the best financial decision I've ever made because it kind of taught me how to make my money work for me the real way. Like my husband always said that like money can work for you. You don't have to work so hard for it because he would do money things that I didn't really understand. But he's great with money. He likes to research money. So when we started the real estate stuff and I saw it like you can literally see. Yeah, we went into some debt for it, but we saved up a certain amount so that we could actually get approved for a loan and all that stuff. Like when you pay off a property and you see that whole return coming to you and then you see the value of that home like skyrocket. If we were to sell one of the homes that we've invested in, we made what we bought it for times three because the market is going up so much. So you literally see like how your money is working for you. And I like that. Yeah. And just for historical context for everybody, 2020, when the pandemic hit, real estate prices have just sort of gone up globally, but especially in the United States. And everything I've read, there's no signs of turning back. No. So if if, if there is a dip in the future, it's not going to be a a 2008 dip. It's going to be like a 20% dip. Yes. (laughs) But once again, not tied to the stock market, not tied to a currency. So it's a real asset that can fluctuate. Right. Well, even now, like we're buying property higher than we purchase other things. So which is why we decided to go with a mortgage on it. We'll still see with renting it out or whatever we decide to do, which even with buying it, closing on it, there's already an increase in what we pay for it just because how fast the market is going up and kind of, you know, it's worth it either way. Yeah, it's, it's a little pricey. You know, in the first couple of months, you're like, I don't know why we did that. <laughs> we got an extra payment. You know, you got to rent it out. Once you see the money coming in, like it's it's an investment that's well worth the money. That's going to keep making you money. So, and I want to point out that you bought it as investment, not to live in. Right. Yes, we have one to live in, but I mean, we bought it in 2017, so we bought it for next next to nothing. We really don't pay much per month for it. it, it it's also an investment because when we we leave this house, we're going to rent it out. So, and then another thing too is. People who are listening might be like, well, I can't afford a house. I can't afford, you know, my rent is X amount. I can't. You could buy a mall, buy a hotel, or you could buy a single family house. There's real estate that is not crazy expensive. There's so much out here. You can buy like a little small, like start small. 
if you have some liquid, like some cash, you can go to an auction and get you a little something and fix it up and make a good return on it. So, What is the worst financial decision that you've ever made? Buying a car, getting a car payment. I hate car payments so much because it's not an asset. You could buy something small that you have cash for. Like my mom has never bought a car. Well, now she does because she's a business owner, but but she pays for her luxury. She likes luxury things. Before that, she never got a car payment. And I never understood how she did it, but she would go find like a Honda Accord and five or ten thousand dollars and she just paid for it and we'd have a car for years, you know, just driving in that car. And then as she started to like get smarter with her money, get older, she started a business. Uh, she started multiple businesses and she had the liquid for it. She would just buy whatever she wanted at that point. But when I got a car on my own, I was yeah, I wanted to get my own car. I wanted something new and I got a car payment. And I was like, this is so dumb because I pay for this car every month and then I can't even sell it for what I bought it for. Like, it's so stupid. I think that part was like getting a a car payment. I don't have a car payment anymore. I paid it off and I love it. It gets me where I need to go, but I don't go. Obviously, nobody's going anywhere right now. So what was the point of the car? (laughs) But it gets me where I need to go. Okay. So with your art, do people just pay you or do you have an entity or a corporation, anything like that? I guess Politically Illustrated would be an entity because I am a business. It's a business. It's trademarked. Um, My name, Destiny Powell, is a business. It's trademarked. So they pay me, but they pay Poetically Illustrated. So when I file my taxes, I have to file Destiny Powell, Poetically Illustrated. And then two businesses that I co-own with my mom, like we file the taxes separately. Okay, so so with those businesses, so I sort of heard maybe there's like you plus three others. Yes, though. Do you have an accountant and do they do all the business taxes? Yes. And everything? How do I explain this? Okay, so my mom is kind of like a tax attorney. She also has tax preparation offices that I co-own with her. So she has maybe four or five branches in Mississippi. So we do have two accountants who do most of the money stuff for us, make sure that we pay quarterly and how much we're paying and make sure we're writing off the right stuff and all that. So, um, yeah, we have accountants. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we own tax professionals, therefore. (laughs) They help out like the way that the accountants make sure that we're also me and my husband co-own his business together, which is the real estate thing. But um, yeah, we need accountants for that because in order to qualify for loans and even your businesses have their own tax credit, plus you have your credit, you want to make sure that you're paying for your taxes and not just writing everything off because when you go to get a loan from someone, they're going to be like, well, yeah, you made X amount of money, but you wrote it all off. So you didn't go home with anything. So you want to make sure you're paying the right amount and taking home some kind of profit so that if you do need a loan or anything, they have some kind of asset to look at, like some kind of income to look at. Ooh, I'm glad I'm talking to you because I try to write everything off. <laughs> well, even, like if you're trying to buy something, they need at least a year or two where you paid. So let's say you make for a year, you're just like, I'm just going to pay um, this amount to show that I brought in at least this amount because they have like a minimum requirement, depending on how much money you're trying to get from them. Then you got to bring in like a certain amount of money. So you look into how much you're trying to buy, how much of a loan you need, how much a down payment you have, and then how much you're going to need the bank to give you. And whatever that is, you need to pay that amount of taxes. Like whatever percentage of taxes that is. So they have some kind of income. Make sure you're making a certain amount. I mean, there's so much you can write off that it's kind of fun. But (laughs) (laughs) the accountants are like, no, if you want to buy a house and build and all that, you're going to need a big loan and you you don't want to just be writing off everything. So Wow, Destiny, I'm not going to lie. I am a little confused by everything you're saying. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) No, I mean, I I follow it. But I feel like we just went over the head of a lot of people. <laughs> it's, I talked to the accountant about it. So if I'm trying to get a loan for 250K, I need to at least bring in 80K. And if I'm bringing in 120 overall, like that's how much I made, even if it went back, some of it went back to the business or whatever. If I made 180 and I wrote off like majority of that to where it shows I made 50K because I didn't want to pay taxes, 
then you're not going to get that loan. So you need to show that you at least brought in 80 and not 50 so that they can give you a loan. So yeah, you made 180K. You probably put more than 80K in your pocket. If you showed the tax people that you only made 50K, you're not going to get a loan. That's what it is. Got it. Okay. Um, okay. So retirement plan. It seems like you're, you have one. <laughs> I do. I think I do. I had to call my mom, but I got it. <laughs> so she says that I have an IRA and it's a Roth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I'm sure everybody listening has heard me say it a million times, but an IRA, individual retirement account, traditional, you save $5,000 for the year, you can deduct that from your taxes. Yes. So you're saving $5,000 on taxes that you're not paying. A Roth, you are paying that $5,000, but when you withdraw it at age 59 and a half. Yeah. Or she said 60 plus. Si- yeah. Okay. We'll say 63. When you pull it out, you don't have to pay the taxes on it. Right. So to me, I always say Roth, 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 mm-hmm. because sometimes financial advisors will say, well, you're making a lot of money right now. So you're paying a lot of taxes on that money you're putting into the Roth. And I say, well, they don't say this to me, but I would say, <laughs> I would say that's okay. If my tax bracket will be lower when I'm older, I want the peace of mind yes. of I already paid it. And like right now, if I can get by paying my taxes now so that I don't have to worry about them in the future, I'm all for that. Yes, my mom does that. Also, my husband served in the military, so we get whatever that was. He served 10 years. They give us like some kind of pension, I think. So he basically retired out of the army. So yeah. So, okay. So you guys are so businessy business. I, man, did I pick the right artist to talk to? <laughs> <laughs> I got lucky there. I I didn't realize. Okay, so he retired, but he has his own business. So he's like working. But he also has a civilian job. So (laughs) So your retirement is your IRA. Do you know how much you put in each year? Like, do you have a goal? Because I think the limit for this year is $6,000 that you can put into an IRA. I do have a goal. But again, my mom handles that part for me and the accountant. But the goal, like I have an overall goal of how much they ask you, like how much do you think you need to live on? So there's like a goal, but every year it kind of changes because I'm like, well, maybe we'll be a little more or a little less. I don't know. But um, as far as how much we put in, sometimes we just like bulk put it in because as an entrepreneur, you kind of make money in spurts. I'm sure we already put in. And if the limit is 6000 that's probably what she put in. So my mom is the one who handles that part because that goes over my head. And she, she's like, okay, I got you. you. You and the kids have life insurance. You and the kids have health insurance. You and, the, and my husband. So we're all still on um, military insurance because it's awesome. I'm not sure. I'm sure she probably. I'll ask her though. I should have asked that. I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's 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 not it's not really important. I just wanted to know like what and you answered it basically, which is like you just bulk put in when the time is is right. Whenever we make it, like she gives me this is how much money you need to put into all of your savings accounts and all this other stuff and college funds and all that. This is how much money I need from you by the end of the year. And so as I make it. I pay down my expenses first. And that's probably a a tip for any entrepreneurs. So if you have like rent or something and you get a bulk, you get make like $10,000, pay as much rent as you can. You know, make sure you pay yourself to at least 30% of that. Give it to yourself in a savings account. You're saving up towards an investment account or anything. And then the rest of that, pay up your expenses so you at least know you have something to live off of. But at least, you know, you got somewhere to stay if you don't, you know. No, if you have any food money, <laughs> you got somewhere to stay. You can always get ramen for like a dollar. So you sound like you're in really good shape. And actually, you're one of those unique individuals where it sounds like your retirement is just like this little part of your plan. And it could be the way that my life is set up because I have like money, money, smart people around me. Like my, my husband kind of taught my mom a lot about money and she has her own real estate business now where she's also investing in property, but she sells property as well. Also with her tax businesses and all her other stuff. I haven't had to worry about it because the people in my life are able to help me with the stuff that I don't want to do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm going to try to summarize what I think all your income sources are. <laughs> they're everywhere. It's a lot. When people talk to me, they're like, how? Definitely your art is a is a big income generator. Yes. Your real estate 
If it's not, it will be eventually. Well, it is right now, but I don't consider that because we don't necessarily touch that money. So I don't know how to explain it. So it's not necessarily income, it's saving. Yeah, it's it's savings, it's investment. Um, and then you have businesses, a separate. And so then your retirement would be the only other thing, which is like, that's just doing it to have it as a best practice. Right. Because the way you're setting up with the real estate, it sounds like that could cover like you could stop your art well the goal was no money pressure on my art and that happened after the first year I don't know what sparked something in my brain that was like I don't want to work this hard and put this pressure it was the custom paintings like I got burned out painting people I don't know and (laughs) certain circumstances where this person may have died I'm very like empathetic person and it it kind of started to bother me mentally Plus, I had all this stuff in my brain that was like visions and stories and things that I wanted to show. But I was so busy painting for money, I couldn't do what I wanted to do. But something in me said, you know what, just don't do it. Just don't do it anymore. So early 2017, I stopped. I was like, I'm not taking any custom painting. I'm just going to do what I want to do. So I took three months and I painted everything that I wanted to paint. In that time, like as soon as I released those paintings, I was making money out of in nowhere. Like, and it was just prints. I didn't have t-shirts. I didn't have hoodies. I didn't have anything but prints. And they were making way more money than I ever made painting because paintings. So I was like, yeah, I just need to do what I'm supposed to do and stop trying to force the money, like stop scheduling the money to come and it'll come to me. I mean, I think that's an awesome place for an artist to be where you're not not relying on money. I feel like that's that's where every artist needs to be. It blocks the creativity. If you're worried about money, you, there's no way you can be creative, especially if you put that burden of bringing in money on your passion, something that you're passionate about, something that you love. The burden to bring in money shouldn't be there because it's going to block you. You're going to be like, if this isn't perfect, I'm not going to make any money <laughs> and I'm not going to like it's not going to do anything. So I don't think that's the best way to go about it. Which job of yours has been the most financially lucrative? Uh, the, obviously, the art. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The art brings in so much income and so much opportunity that I just can't even. Nothing has brought in as much money as the art. Probably the real estate in the long run, but right now, it's the art. What is the best financial? Oh wait, no wait. Side question, which is, how old are your kids now? Uh, my oldest is nine, and my middle one is six, and my youngest is three. I have three boys. <laughs> that's that's a that's a handful. Yeah, they're interesting, but I love them. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. So I see people on the social media that wear t-shirts that say "boss mom." Usually, when I see that, I think they're not really a boss mom. <laughs> <laughs> But I feel like you really are like a boss mom. <laughs> one that says mother hustler. And it was a gift for one of my friends. And she was like, I have to get this for you. Because when I, every time I see it, I'm like, that's the only mom I know who's like the biggest hustler in the world. <laughs> so I only have that one. But if I see a boss mom, one, I will buy it. <laughs> uh, what is the best financial advice that somebody has given you? You can't buy something just because you want to. <laughs> Because I would just buy something because I have the money, even if it's my last hundred dollars. And if I want it, I'm going to buy it. That's not that's not um, the best way to think about money. You should do something that will flip it, honestly. So, yeah, that would probably be it. Sometimes people have told me and my wife that we're cheap. I completely disagree because I'm like, we spend plenty of money and we spend it on what we want to spend it on. But we just don't. Like, we don't just get stuff because we want to get it. Yeah. It's not our style. No, it's not mine anymore either. And it's so funny because my mom is the biggest shopper in the world. Like, she comes to visit us. She wants to go to the Louis Vuitton store. She wants to hit Chanel. Like, she wants to go to the big places. And I go in and look at a bracelet and I'm like, you guys dollars. I would never pay $3,000 for a bracelet, like $2 maybe. (laughs) (laughs) That's what she likes. Like, that's her thing. And so I don't pick up anything. But when I was younger and I would go shopping with her, I would just get what I wanted because that's what she taught me to do. But now that I'm with my husband and I see, like, if you want that dream house, that dream land, and that studio that's like a mile away from the house that you can walk to is still on your property, you can't buy $3,000 bags, honey. You just can't do it because you have bigger goals. I want to send my kids, if they want to go to college, they have money for that. If they want to start a business, they have money for that. If they want to mentor or whatever and take a year off to travel the globe, they have money for that. 
And that's because I'm not buying frivolous things that I don't need. And I don't even want them anymore. Honestly, they, my husband has to buy shoes for me because I won't even buy shoes anymore. But one thing I can say that is a weak spot is the art supplies. Like if I go in the art supply store, I will buy whatever I want. But other than that, <laughs> or film and equipment, because I'm getting into YouTube and filming videos and Patreon and stuff like that, which will be another income stream. So that's it. I don't really spend money on things. I'm sure people call me cheap all the time, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> they would tell it to your face. P- people are not shy about saying that. I used to call my husband cheap all the time. I'm like, babe, you can stretch a dollar. Oh, so far. I mean, that's a good thing. So I'm happy about it because I've been able to live a comfortable life, taking a leap, leaving my job because I followed financial advice from someone who was more strict with money. What is the worst financial advice that anyone has given you? Rob Peter to pay Paul. (laughs) That's a recipe for disaster. I think I was in college and I was working two jobs and I was still like having a hard time, like buying books and supplies and paying daycare for my son and paying our light bill. And I was like, I only had like a couple of bills in the house to pay, but I could never pay them because I was shopping or whatever. Someone, I can't remember who it was, but they were like, yeah, girl, just rob Peter and pay Paul. Like, if you need to pay this bill right now, then what bill can wait? And I was like, no, I would, <laughs> that's horrible advice. What financial advice would you give an artist starting out right now? Or would you give yourself back when you started out? Um, trust the process. Make sure that you have a plan. Even if the plan doesn't go the way it's supposed to go or the way you think it should go, make sure that you have a plan in place. And honestly, make sure you have some kind of savings because I'm I'm just not the one that would say take the leap because you don't know when the money's going to come in as an entrepreneur doing anything. That first year may not be lucrative. I know some people, you know, start a business in the first year they take off and you may take off and make, you know, $100,000, but you're probably not going to take that all home because you don't understand shipping and uh, all the surcharges with websites and all the other stuff. Make sure you have some kind of savings, some kind of cushion to keep you going and so that you take the pressure off your art to bring in money and trust your process. Like trust that it's going to be a journey and it, and it takes 10,000 hours to master anything. So be patient with yourself and trust the process. What can you and I do to stress the importance of finance and savings to our fellow artists? We got to talk about it like we're doing right now. Honestly, I can all I can do is give you my horror stories of not being able to pay my bills and because I wasn't saving because I was being frivolous and deciding, you know, I'm going to go get this $7 cup of coffee even though I can make some coffee at home. (laughs) So it's important to save so that you can invest in your future. Like you want to think about your future self. You don't want to think about you right now. You want to think about in the future, starting this business or whatever I'm doing. This is what I want my future to look like. And in order to get there, I have to save. I mean, you got to save to invest. Like even if you're investing nickels and dimes, like you need some kind of savings to get you by. Okay, I love that advice. And I love that I'm talking to you because I feel like just you being you and talking to us, you are an example of an artist who has done financially very well. And for whatever reasons, you've sort of outlined them. You have complete control of your life. Okay, everyone listening, look at Destiny. Obviously, there's 99% of life that we can't control, but that 1% that we can, Destiny has full control of that. And it's amazing to see. Yes. I mean, I'm just glad that I had people in my corner who were like, okay, my husband is always 10 steps ahead as far as thinking. And I'm always right in the moment as far as thinking. So we kind of had to combine that. And he's like, okay, I understand that you're happy right now. You're successful right now. But I need you to think about destiny in five years. Like, what do you want that to look like? And when he started putting it in perspective like that, I was like, okay, you're right. So we're going to put the shoes back. We're going to put the bag back <laughs> and I'm gonna put it in my savings account. Okay. Thank you. It tends to be taboo to talk about money. Yeah. So like a lot of people avoid it, but it's like, it's not, don't avoid it. No. Focus on it. Not the whole time, but like you have to focus on it. And if you focus on it, then you can realize this is how you have to make money. Yeah. There's no magical other way. Not really complicated, but you have to sort of focus on it, figure it out and and do it. Well, it's important that we talk about money. I don't I don't like that artists are always like, well, I don't want to talk about money. Well, in order for the next person, which I'm not that person who's going to be like, I'm going to hold all the secrets. So nobody else knows how to make money. 
I need everybody else to know how to make money because I need you to understand that there's enough money for everybody. There's a piece of the pie for everybody. You don't have to live hand to mouth and it's easy to access it. You just need to know what your goal is and what you're looking for. Like, what do you want? How much money will get you by as far as your basic necessities? Okay, let's make a plan to make that. And then once you see that you can make that, then you can start setting your bigger goals and what you, what do you want your future to look like? So we start saving towards that because savings go a long way. Even if you want to think about getting loans before I even thought about, I never got a business loan, but if I wanted to at this point, I could. And that's because I have something to say. I'm smart with money and I have enough in the bank. I just want to take a risk with someone else's money. So, <laughs> and they'll give it to you. So yeah, you got to have something. Okay, so we're, we're to the final questions. What separates those that have a full-time career as an artist versus those people that never try it or try it for a while and end up doing something else? I say fear, because fear can hold you back from so many things and comparison. So being afraid to try and comparing yourself to someone else's journey. So someone may compare themselves to me or another artist that they consider successful and they'll be afraid to try it with their own art. Well, I won't post this because so-and-so just posted something that looks 10 times better than this. Well, you're never going to know you're doing what you're supposed to be doing if you, you didn't try in the first place. I don't know. Maybe I'm not that competitive. Maybe it's just a non-competitive person in me. I like to stay in my lane. And to me, I'm a great artist, despite whoever else may be a great artist. I'm on my own individual journey. That doesn't mean I'm better or worse than anyone. That's my journey. This is my lane. And the only way, the only person I have to compare to is me. If last year, what I was doing is better than what I'm doing this year, that's my fault. So I got to fix that. Now, I mean, that's another thing with artists is artists are individuals. And even if there's two that you think are basically the same, they're not. And I know there's the United States of America with its individualism that's killing us. Yeah. That's separate from artists. Right. <laughs> artists have to take care of themselves. Exactly. And you can't worry about what the next person is doing as far as individualism goes. Like, I don't want to be trendy. I want my art to have longevity and be specific to me and my experiences. I don't want people to think like... You, if you keep comparing, like, I'm supposed to look, be like this person or look like this person or whatever. So you, you can be individualistic and still have some compassion for others. So. Also, also, just to hammer home that painting you did of the car, there was nothing for you to compare yourself to. Like, I imagine you did not go look at a bunch of other painters and be like, how did they paint the car? It's like, no, I need to paint this car and do it. And that's just you doing it completely separate than anyone else would have done. I didn't even think about that. <laughs> like going to look at some other paintings I was like he said can you paint my car I was like sure which one I took some pictures and I went home and started painting like so it was simple but I that's hilarious like I never I never think about that that's so funny you're just out there doing your thing you seem like you're in a league of your own but if I see another artist obviously I study other artists and I see other artists um, I have art friends so we talk about the different things that we do but even when I'm doing something I never go look at another artist or look at the idea that I had and try to find someone else who has the same idea. I honestly don't never thought about to do that. So <laughs> I'm just like, oh, this is what I want to paint. So this is what I'm going to do. And I go for it because the way I paint it is never going to be the way that someone else painted it. Final question. Where can people find out more about you? Destiny Desired on Twitter. I'm poetically illustrated on Instagram. I'm poetically illustrated.net is my website. Facebook poetically illustrated. I'm on TikTok. Destiny, I cannot thank you enough for sitting down and chatting. No problem. I'm excited. Uh, no one's ever asked me about money. I was excited to talk about money. No one asks artists about money because they just assume we're starving. <laughs> that was our interview with Destiny Powell. My takeaways were figure out how to make money. Figure out how much money you need and how you can get that money. Once you're making money, save. It's the age-old adage. You have to have money to make money. So make sure to save for your future self. Once you've saved money, figure out how to make money work for you. Right now, your skills as an artist can bring you money. But if you want to thrive, you have to put your money to work and let it grow for you. 
You do that by investing in assets. And our definition of an asset is something that puts money in your pocket. For Destiny, that is her Roth IRA, the businesses she's invested in, the art she rents out and sells, and real estate rentals. Her car is not an asset, nor is the house she lives in. When she moves out of the house and begins to rent it, then it will become an asset. If you liked this interview, find the additional conversation over at Patreon. You can become a producer of this show for as little as $3 a month. Do that at patreon.com slash artistic finance. And for any painters out there who aren't ready to become a patron but want to hear the rest of Destiny's interview, email me at artisticfinancepodcast at gmail.com and I'll share the audio directly with you for free. That's it for today. Until next time, break a leg. Thank you for listening to Artistic Finance. Find more information on our website, artisticfinance.com. Please subscribe to our podcast and please leave a rating and review. Artistic Finance is produced in New York City by Nicole and Ethan Steimel. Producing consultant Anne Nygren-Doherty. Graphics and website by Josh Cutler. Music by Chong Liu. Music by Chong Liu.